In Daniel's second chapter, we read that he had a confusing dream about a giant statue made of different materials. Each part of the statue stood for a different kingdom on earth. We figured out what this complex dream meant and saw how God was in control of what happened in history. Now we're about to discover something new. In Daniel chapter 7, there's another dream. This time it's about scary beasts coming out of the sea, each one more frightening than the last, and all of them have important meanings. We can still hear the whispers of the past, but we need to look ahead. The dreams and visions in the book of Daniel are a light in the dark, helping us understand God's big plan for all of time. Get ready to dive deep into these mysterious prophecies where symbols tell us more than words can, where beasts stand for kingdoms, and where dreams give us a peek into God's world. As we explore these strange dreams of beasts and prophecies, let's not forget the lesson from the statue in Daniel chapter 2. Its broken pieces remind us that earthly kingdoms don't last forever, but God's power does. Are you ready to see these prophecies come to life? To be with Daniel as the sea gets rough and the beasts appear? I invite you to travel alongside me in our search for truth. In the first year of King Belshazzar's reign in Babylon, Daniel had a dream. He saw visions while he was in bed. Then he wrote the dream down and explained the main points. Daniel said, I had a dream at night, and I saw the four winds of the sky stirring up the big sea. Four huge creatures came out of the sea, each one different from the others. Daniel 7, 1, 3. We should usually take the language in the Bible literally, unless there's a good reason to think it's meant to be a symbol. Any symbol should be explained with a literal equivalent. The words used here are clearly symbols, as shown in verse 17. These big creatures, which are four, represent four kings that will rise from the earth. The idea of kingdoms, not just individual kings, can be seen in the phrase, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. To explain verse 23, the angel said, the fourth beast will be the fourth kingdom on the earth. So these creatures symbolize four big kingdoms. The circumstances when they appeared, as shown in the prophecy, are also explained with symbols. The symbols used include the four winds, the sea, four huge creatures, ten horns, and another horn with eyes and a mouth that fights against God and his people. Now we have to figure out what these symbols mean. In symbolic language, winds stand for conflict, political upheaval, and war. As the prophet Jeremiah said, the Lord of hosts says, look, trouble will spread from nation to nation and a huge storm will start from the corners of the earth. And the Lord's victims will be at that day from one end of the earth to the other. Jeremiah 25, 32, 33. The prophet talks about a fight that the Lord will have with all nations. The conflict and chaos causing this destruction is called a huge storm. The fact that winds symbolize conflict and war is clear within the vision itself. Because of the winds blowing, kingdoms rise and fall through political conflict. Seas or waters, when used as a symbol in the Bible, mean people, nations, and languages. The angel told the prophet John, the waters you saw are people, lots of people, nations, and languages. Revelation 17, 15. The symbol of the four creatures is explained to Daniel before the vision ends. These big creatures, which are four, represent four kings that will rise from the earth, verse 17. With this explanation of the symbols, the vision's scope is clearly set out for us. Since these creatures stand for four kings or kingdoms, we need to ask, where do we start and which four empires are represented? These creatures appear one after another as they are numbered from the first to the fourth. The last one is there when all earthly events end with the final judgment. From Daniel's time until the end of the world's history, there were to be only four universal kingdoms, as we learned from Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the grand image in Daniel 2, interpreted by the prophet 65 years earlier. Daniel was still living under the kingdom symbolized by the head of gold, so the first creature of this vision must represent the same kingdom as the head of gold of the grand image, that is, Babylon. The other creatures probably symbolize the kingdoms that followed that one, but if this vision covers basically the same time period as the image in Daniel 2, 
You might wonder why it's necessary. Wasn't the first vision enough? In reply, we say that the history of world empires is revisited again and again to show more details and present more facts and features. This is how we get line upon line according to the scriptures. In chapter 2, only the political aspects of world domination are shown. Here, earthly governments are shown in relation to God's truth and God's people. Their true nature is revealed through symbols of wild and dangerous creatures, giving us a deeper understanding of their roles and behaviors. Each new look at these empires gives a deeper and richer perspective, letting us fully understand the complex interaction between divine guidance and human ambition throughout history. The first creature was like a lion with eagle's wings. Daniel watched until its wings were torn off. It was lifted off the ground, stood on two feet like a human, and was given a human mind. Daniel 7, 4 In Daniel's seventh dream, the first creature he saw was a lion. To understand what a lion symbolizes, we can look at Jeremiah 4, 7, 50, 17, 43, 44. In this dream, the lion has eagle's wings. The symbolic use of wings is shown clearly in Habakkuk 1, 6, 8 where it says that the Chaldeans will fly like an eagle swooping to devour. From these symbols, we can guess that Babylon was a very strong kingdom, and under King Nebuchadnezzar, its conquests spread quickly. But then came a time when the wings were torn off. The nation no longer attacked its enemies like an eagle. The bravery and power of the lion was gone. Instead, it had a human heart, weak, scared, and cowardly, replacing the strong heart of a lion. This accurately described the state of the nation in its last years, as it had become weak and worn out because of its wealth and luxury. Then I saw another creature that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. They told it, Get up and eat lots of meat. Daniel 7, 5 Similar to the image in Daniel 2, this series of symbols shows a noticeable decline from one kingdom to the next. The silver of the chest and arms is inferior to the gold of the head, just like the bear is inferior to the lion. Medo-Persia didn't have the wealth, splendor, and brilliance of Babylon. The bear raised itself up on one side, showing the two nationalities of the Medes and Persians. This fact is also shown by the two horns of the ram in Daniel 8. It is said that the higher horn came up last, and in the same way, the bear raised itself up on one side. This prophecy came true when the Persian division of the kingdom, which came later, became more important, becoming the dominant power in the nation. See commentary on Daniel 8, 3. The three ribs probably symbolize the three provinces of Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt, which were especially conquered by Medo-Persia. The command, get up and eat lots of meat, seems to refer to the energy the Medes and Persians got from conquering these provinces. This power is well represented by a bear. The Medes and Persians were known for their cruelty and greed, seizing and plundering people. The Medo-Persian kingdom lasted from the fall of Babylon under Cyrus until the Battle of Arbella in 331 BC, a period of 207 years. Then I saw another creature that looked like a leopard, which had four wings of a bird on its back. The creature also had four heads, and it was given authority. Daniel 7, 6 The third kingdom, Greece, is represented by a leopard. If the wings on the lion meant quick conquests, they would mean the same thing here. The leopard itself is known for its speed, but this wasn't enough to show the nature of this nation. It needed wings in addition to its natural speed. Not just two, like the lion had, but four. This symbol suggests a remarkable speed which is historically true for the Greek kingdom. The conquests of Greece under Alexander were unmatched in ancient times for their speed and suddenness. B.W. Tarn summarizes his military accomplishments. Alexander was a master of combining various arms. He introduced the world to the advantages of winter campaigning, the importance of relentless pursuit, and the principle of march divided, fight united. He usually marched in two divisions, with one managing the impediments while his own division traveled light. His extraordinary speed was attributed to never putting anything off. The vast distances covered in uncharted territory demanded exceptional organizational skills. 
Within 10 years, he faced only two significant setbacks. Had a lesser man attempted his achievements and failed, the insurmountable military difficulties of the undertaking would have been widely criticized. The creature had also four heads. The unity of the Greek Empire didn't last longer than Alexander's life. After his amazing career ended with a fever caused by a drinking spree, the empire was split among his four main generals. Cassander ruled Macedonia and Greece in the west. Lysimachus controlled Thrace and parts of Asia on the Hellespont and Bosphorus in the north. Ptolemy was in charge of Egypt, Lydia, Arabia, Palestine, and Coel Syria in the south. And Seleucus took over Syria and the rest of Alexander's eastern territories. By 301 BC, with the death of Antigonus, the division of Alexander's kingdom into four parts was completed by his generals. These divisions are represented by the four heads of the leopard. So the prediction came true exactly as said. Alexander didn't leave behind someone suitable to take over. So why didn't his massive empire break up into lots of small parts? Why did it only split into four? The answer is in the prophecy that saw and said this would happen. The leopard had four heads, the rough goat had four horns, and the empire was to be split into four parts. And that's exactly what happened. Next I saw in a dream a fourth animal. It was terrifying, scary, and really powerful. It had massive iron teeth. It ate and crushed everything, stomping on anything that was left over. It was different from all the animals before it and had ten horns. Daniel 7, 7. The power shown here is so different from the others that there's no real animal to compare it to. Nothing from any animal would be enough to describe it. This power is totally different from the ones before it, and it's unique, nothing like any animal we know of. Verse 7 sets up a big analysis, but I'll try to keep it short. This beast is the same as the fourth part of the big image, the iron legs. The commentary on Daniel 2.40 gives reasons to see this power as Rome, and the same reasons apply here. Rome fits perfectly the iron part of the image and the beast described here. Its power and the fear it caused are just like the prophecy said. The world had never seen such a strong power. It ate with its iron teeth and broke everything in its path. It crushed countries under its tough feet. The beast had ten horns, which verse 24 says are ten kings or kingdoms that would come from this empire. As we talked about before in the commentary on Daniel 2, Rome was split into ten kingdoms. These divisions have been called the ten kingdoms of the Roman Empire ever since. I looked at the horns and saw another small horn grow among them. It pulled up three of the first horns by the roots, and this horn had eyes like human eyes and a mouth that said big things. Daniel 7, 8. Daniel was really interested in the horns. Something strange happened among them. A new horn, small at first but bigger than the others later, grew upward. This new horn didn't just want to find a place for itself. It wanted to take over other places and replace them. Because of this, three kingdoms were uprooted. This little horn's rise. As we'll talk about later, this little horn represents the papacy. The three uprooted horns symbolize the Heruli, Ostrogoths, and Vandals, who were removed because they disagreed with the papacy's beliefs and claims. This horn had eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things, which perfectly describe the cleverness, understanding, and bold claims of a misguided religious organization. I watched until thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days sat down. His clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne was like a flaming fire and its wheels were burning. A stream of fire came from him. A thousand thousand served him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood in front of him. The court was ready and the books were opened. Daniel 7, 9, 10. There's hardly a more grand and awe-inspiring scene in the entire sacred text. Not just the powerful and lofty images catch our attention, but the very scene itself demands serious attention as the judgment affects all of us in matters of eternal importance. An unfortunate translation in verse 9 might give a wrong impression. The phrase cast down comes from the Chaldee word remi, which can mean thrown by violence as used when the three Hebrews were thrown into the fiery furnace and Daniel into the lion's den. 
But another equally correct translation is to set or place in order, as with the setting up of judgment seats mentioned here, and similarly in Revelation 4, 2, where the Greek supports the same meaning. The revised version in Daniel 7, 9 reads, Thrones were placed, as Gesenius defines the root Rima, citing Daniel 7, 9 as an example. The Ancient of Days, God the Father, oversees the judgment. Note the description of him. Those who think God doesn't have a personality must agree that he's shown here as a personal being, but they comfort themselves by saying this is the only description of its kind in the Bible. We don't agree with this claim, however, even if it were true. Wouldn't one such description be as harmful to their belief as if it were repeated 20 times? The countless thousands who serve him and stand in front of him aren't sinners brought before the judgment seat, but heavenly beings doing his will. John saw the same heavenly servants around God's throne and described the magnificent scene. I watched, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and their number was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. Revelation 5.11 To fully understand these verses, you need to know about the sanctuary services. The end of Christ's work, our great high priest, inside the heavenly sanctuary, shows the judgment work introduced here. It's an investigative judgment. The books are opened and everyone's cases are looked at before that grand court, deciding in advance who will receive eternal life when the Lord comes to give it to his people. As evident from the evidence of Daniel 8.14, this serious work is currently being done in the sanctuary above. So because of all the big bold things the horn was saying, I watched and saw how this beast was killed, its body destroyed, and then thrown into a burning fire. Regarding the other beasts, they lost their power but were allowed to live for a while longer. Daniel 7.11 The End of the Fourth Beast some people think there will be a thousand years of peace before Christ returns. Others believe that after Christ's coming, the righteous will get another chance to save the sinners. But neither of these theories can be proven by the Bible. The scary fourth beast and the little horn keep going, the horn still saying awful things, leading many people into false beliefs until the beast is finally thrown into the fire. This isn't a change of heart, but a destruction. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 Unlike the first three beasts who lived on after their rule was over, the fourth beast doesn't get to live. The kingdoms of Babylon, Persia, and Greece continued, although they were conquered. But what comes after the fourth kingdom? There's no government or country that comes after it. Its end is the lake of fire, and there's nothing beyond that. The lion turned into the bear, the bear into the leopard, and the leopard into the fourth beast. But the fourth beast doesn't turn into something else. Its destiny is the lake of fire. During a vision in the night, I saw something like the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. He went to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him close to him. He was given power, honor, and a kingdom so that all people, nations, and languages would serve him. His rule is forever, it won't ever end, and his kingdom will never be destroyed. Daniel 7.13 the event shown here isn't about Christ coming back to earth. This is because the Ancient of Days isn't on earth, and the one who's arriving is going towards the Ancient of Days. The Son of Man is given power, honor, and a kingdom in the presence of the Father. Christ receives his kingdom before he returns to earth. Luke 19.10, 12. This event takes place in heaven and is closely tied to the events mentioned in verses 9 and 10. Christ receives his kingdom once he's done with his priestly duties in the sanctuary. Those who are meant to serve him are the saved ones, Revelation 21, 24. Not the wicked people of the earth because they'll be destroyed when Christ comes back. Psalm 2, 9, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. From all the people, tribes, and families of the earth, those who are happy to serve God will come. These are the ones who will inherit the kingdom of our Lord. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by what I saw in my visions. I approached one of those standing nearby and asked him to explain what all this meant. He told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth, 
but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, forever and ever. Daniel 7, 15, 18. We should want to understand these things just as much as Daniel did. When we sincerely seek answers, we can be sure that God is just as ready to help us understand these important truths today as he was in Daniel's time. We've already explained the beasts and the kingdoms they represent. We followed along with the prophet through a series of events, ending with the destruction of the fourth beast and the end of all earthly governments. Then the story changes, and we find out that the saints will receive the kingdom. Verse 18. The saints, who are often laughed at, insulted, persecuted, and thrown out, thought of as the least likely to ever get what they're hoping for, are the ones who will end up with the kingdom, owning it forever. The wicked won't be in charge or mismanage things anymore. The inheritance that was lost because of sin will be taken back. There will always be peace and righteousness in the world that's been made new. I wanted to understand more about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and very scary. It had iron teeth and brass claws, devoured and crushed everything, and stomped on what was left with its feet. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other one that grew up and made three of them fall, the one that had eyes and a mouth that spoke really big things and which seemed more important than its companions. Daniel 7, 19, 20. Daniel understood the first three beasts in his vision quite well, but the fourth beast really surprised him because of its strange and terrifying nature. He wanted to know more about this beast and its ten horns, especially the last little horn that seemed more important than the others. The lion needed to have two wings added to represent Babylon. The bear needed to show an unnatural fierceness with three ribs in its mouth to represent Medo Persia and the leopard had to have four wings and three extra heads to represent Greece. But there was no animal in nature that could represent the fourth kingdom. So the vision showed a never-before-seen beast, a horrifying creature with brass claws and iron teeth, so brutal and vicious that it ate, crushed, and trampled its victims, all just for the sake of dominating. What really caught Daniel's attention was a little horn that came up and, being just like the beast it came from, pushed aside three other horns. This horn had eyes, not animal eyes, but smart human eyes, and it had a mouth that spoke arrogant words and made audacious claims. It's no wonder Daniel wanted to know more about this strange and monstrous thing. The following verses give us more details about the little horn, helping those studying prophecy to understand this symbol without making any mistakes. I saw that this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. Daniel 7, 21, 22. Daniel was particularly struck by how this little horn was fighting so angrily against the saints. We've already talked about the Ten Horns, or the splitting of Rome into ten kingdoms between AD 351 and 476, in the commentary on Daniel 2:41. Because these horns represent kingdoms, the little horn must also represent a kingdom, but a different kind because it was not like the others. They were political kingdoms, so does there exist a different kind of kingdom that has arisen among the ten parts of the Roman Empire since AD 476? Yes, it's the spiritual kingdom of the papacy. This power fits the symbol in every detail as we will see. Daniel saw this power fighting against the saints. Did the papacy do this? The many martyrs say yes. Think about the brutal persecution of the Waldenses, the Albigenses and Protestants in general by the papal authority. In verse 22, we see three events happening one after the other. Looking from when the little horn was at its most powerful to the end of the long battle between the saints and Satan and all his helpers, Daniel points out three key events. The arrival of the Ancient of Days, which refers to when Jehovah starts the judgment described in verses 9 and 10. The judgment being given to the saints, which indicates the time when the saints will sit with Christ in judgment for a thousand years after the first resurrection. Revelation 21, 4. During this time, they will decide on the punishment for the wicked. The martyrs will judge the powerful persecutor that, during their days of suffering, hunted them down and spilled their blood. The moment when the saints get the kingdom, which means they will enter the new earth. 
By this time, all traces of the curse of sin and sinners will have disappeared, and the land that was so poorly governed by the wicked powers of the earth, the enemies of God's people, will be given to the righteous who will own it forever. So he said the fourth beast will be the fourth kingdom on earth, different from all other kingdoms. It will devour the entire earth, trample it down and break it into pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom and another will rise after them. He will be different from the first ones and will overthrow three kings. He will speak against the Most High and will exhaust the saints of the Most High. He will try to change times and laws and they will be under his control for a time, times, and half a time. But judgment will come and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed in the end. Daniel 7, 23, 26. We've already discussed enough about the fourth beast, Rome, and the ten horns or ten kingdoms that came from this beast. Now we'll focus more on the little horn that needs a closer look. As mentioned in the verse 8 commentary, this horn's rise and actions align with the rise and work of the papacy. So it's really interesting and important to look into what caused this power to rise. The early church leaders or bishops in Rome were respected because of the city they lived in. In the first few centuries after Christ, Rome was the biggest, richest, and most influential city in the world. It was the center of the empire and the capital of nations. Julian said that all the world's people belonged to Rome and Claudian called it the Fountain of Laws. The Roman bishops thought, if Rome is the queen of cities, why shouldn't her bishop be the king of bishops? Why shouldn't the Roman church be the mother of all Christian churches? Why shouldn't all nations be her children and her authority their supreme law? According to Daubigny, from whom these quotes come, ambitious men found it easy to think this way. And ambitious Rome did just that. Bishops throughout the Roman Empire liked to give the Bishop of Rome some of the honor their city got from the world. At first, this didn't mean they were dependent on him, but Daubigny said that, usurped power grows like an avalanche. Admonitions that were brotherly at first soon changed into commands from the Pope. The Western bishops supported the Roman bishops' power grab, either because they were jealous of the Eastern bishops or because they would rather answer to a Pope than a temporal power. These influences helped the Bishop of Rome quickly become the spiritual leader of all Christian churches. The fourth century saw something stand in the way of this ambition. The prophecy had said that the power represented by the little horn would subdue three kings. The rise and spread of Arianism at the start of the fourth century and the challenge it posed to papal supremacy pushed the papal power to remove three of the kingdoms of Western Rome. Arius, a parish priest from the important church of Alexandria, spread his doctrine all over the world, causing a big argument in the Christian church. So Emperor Constantine called a council at Nicaea in AD 325 to examine and decide on its teachings. Arius said that the son was totally and essentially different from the father that he was a literal son who the father had generated from nothing, the word by which the father formed the universe, and therefore less than the father in authority, but not in nature and dignity. This idea was condemned by the council, which said that Christ was the same as the father. Arius was then sent into exile in Illyria, and his followers were made to accept the creed that was decided at the council. But this didn't end the argument. It continued to disturb the Christian world for centuries, with Arians becoming strong opponents of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. The spread of Arianism threatened to stop the progress of Catholicism, and it was clear that if Italy and its capital were controlled by people who believed in Arianism, it would be bad for a Catholic bishop's supremacy. But the prophecy had said that this horn, representing the papacy, would rise to supreme power and, in reaching this position, would overthrow three kings. The little horn overthrows three Aryan groups. There's been some disagreement about exactly which powers the papacy beat during its rise. Albert Barnes notes, after the fall of the Roman Empire, it got pretty chaotic, and we don't have complete records of everything that happened as the papacy was rising. So it might be hard to find clear evidence of this prophecy coming true. But we can still pretty confidently say that the prophecy was fulfilled in the history of the papacy.
Joseph Meade thinks the three overthrown kingdoms were the Greeks, Lombards, and Franks. Sir Isaac Newton, however, thinks they were the Exarchate of Ravenna, the Lombards, and the Senate and Dukedom of Rome. Thomas Newton disagrees with both of them. He says the Franks can't have been one of these kingdoms because they were never beaten. The Lombards can't have been one because they were never ruled by the popes. And as Albert Barnes says, I can't find any evidence that the kingdom of the Lombards was one of the sovereignties that came under the authority of the popes. The Senate and Dukedom of Rome can't have been one because they were never one of the ten kingdoms three of which were supposed to be beaten by the little horn. The problem with these interpretations might come from the idea that the prophecy about the papacy rising hadn't been fulfilled until the Pope became a prince. So they tried to find fulfillment of the prophecy in the events leading up to the Pope's temporal rule. But the prophecy in verses 24 and 25 seems to be about the Pope's power over people's minds and consciences, not his civil power. The papacy reached this position in A.D. 538, as we'll show later. The word before in verses 8 and 20 comes from the Chaldee word kadam, which basically means front. When you combine it with min, which means from, it translates to from the presence of, according to Davidson. So it's like before in terms of place. This makes sense in verse 10 where it's translated in the authorized version as from before him. In verse 8, the little horn is pictured pushing its way among the ten and forcefully uprooting three horns from in front of it. In verse 20, it says the three horns fell from in front of it, as if it had beaten them. In verse 24, another king representing the little horn shall subdue three kings' horns, likely by force. While Kadam can also refer to time, it's more likely referring to place in these verses. Edward Eliot seems to agree with this interpretation. We confidently suggest that the three powers, or horns, that were uprooted were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, based on trustworthy historical information. Odoacer, the leader of the Heruli, was the first barbarian to rule the Romans. He took over Italy in A.D. 476. About his religion, Gibbon says, like the rest of the barbarians, he had been taught the Arian heresy, but he respected monks and bishops, and the silence of the Catholics shows they were tolerated. Gibbon also notes, the Ostrogoths, the Burgundians, the Suevi, and the Vandals, who had heard Latin clergy speak, preferred the simpler teachings of their own teachers, and Arianism became the official faith of these warrior converts who had settled on the ruins of the Western Empire. This religious difference constantly caused jealousy and hatred, and the term barbarian was made worse by the even more disliked term heretic. The northern heroes, who were reluctant to believe that all their ancestors were in hell, were shocked and angry to learn that they themselves were just damned in a different way. The Arian belief had a big impact on the church back then, as seen in this quote. A ton of Gothic people who invaded the Roman Empire were Christians who followed the Arian faith. Our first German translation of the Bible was by an Arian missionary, Ulfilas. The first conquerors of Rome and Africa, Alaric and Genseric, were Arians. Theodoric the Great, king of Italy and the hero of the Nibelungen Lied, was an Arian. His empty tomb in Ravenna shows how the Orthodox people got back at him when they won. They tore down the vase where his Arian followers had put his ashes. Ranka notes, The church faced a lot of difficulties and everything changed. Pagan people took over Britain. Arian kings took over most of the remaining West while the Lombards, who were longtime Arians and dangerous enemies, set up a strong rule right next to Rome. Meanwhile, the Roman bishops, surrounded on all sides, worked hard and carefully to regain control at least in their own diocese. Machiavelli points out, it's interesting that almost all the wars the northern barbarians fought in Italy were stirred up by the popes, and the hordes that flooded the country were usually called by them. How these Arian kings related to the Pope is shown in this account from Mosheim's church history. It's clear from a lot of reliable records that both the emperors and the nations were not willing to put up with the control that the Pope's office was trying to force on the Christian church. The Gothic princes limited the power of the Bishop of Rome in Italy, wouldn't let anyone become the Pope without their approval, and kept for themselves the right to judge whether each new election was legal. 
This can be seen in the story of Odoacer, the first Arian king mentioned. When Pope Simplicius died in AD 483, the clergy and people gathered to choose a new pope. But then Basilius, Odoacer's lieutenant, showed up at the gathering, was surprised they would try to pick a new pope without him, said in the king's name that everything they had done was meaningless, and told them to start the election over. At the same time, Zeno, the eastern emperor and friend of the pope, wanted to kick Odoacer out of Italy. But he didn't have to do anything himself because Theodoric had become king of the Ostrogothic kingdom in Moesia and Pannonia. Theodoric was on good terms with Zeno, so he wrote to him, saying he couldn't keep his Goths in the poor province of Pannonia, and asked if he could lead them to a better place to conquer and live. Zeno said yes, he could go against Odoacer and take over Italy. So after a five-year war, the Herulian kingdom in Italy was beaten. Odoacer was sneakily killed and Theodoric set up his Ostrogoths in Italy. As mentioned before, he was an Arian, and the law that Odoacer had made saying the king had to approve the election of the Pope stayed in effect. This shows how much the papacy was under the control of the Arian king. In AD 523, when Catholics in the East were persecuting Arians, Theodoric called Pope John and told him, if the emperor, Justin, the predecessor of Justinian, doesn't think it's right to take back the edict against my people, i.e. the Arians. I'll make a similar edict against his people, i.e. the Catholics, and make sure it's strictly enforced. Those who don't follow the faith of Nice are heretics to him, and those who do are heretics to me. Whatever excuses or justifies his harshness towards the former will do the same for my harshness towards the latter. So I need you to go to Constantinople and protest in both my name and yours against the aggressive actions that court has so carelessly taken up. You can influence the emperor's decisions, and until you've done that and the Catholics, Theodoric is talking about the Arians here, are allowed to freely practice their religion and get their churches back, you can't think about coming back to Italy. The Pope, who was directly ordered by the Arian emperor to stay away from Italy until he did what the king wanted, couldn't really aim for any kind of supremacy until that authority was removed. The feelings of the Pope's side towards Theodoric can be understood by how they treated his memory. They disrespected his tomb by taking away the container that held the ashes his Arian supporters had placed there. Baronius makes these feelings clear, calling Theodoric a cruel barbarian, a barbarous tyrant, and an impious Arian. At the same time, the Catholics in Italy were under the rule of an Arian king and facing harsh treatment from the Arian Vandals in Africa. Eliot notes, The Vandal kings were not just Arians, but also harsh on the Catholics. This was true in Sardinia and Corsica under Roman church rule, and likely in Africa too. In AD 533, Justinian started his wars against the Vandals and Goths, looking for the backing of the Pope and the Catholic group. He made a big decision to make the Pope the head of all churches, starting papal supremacy in A.D. 538. During the African and Italian campaigns, all Catholics welcomed Belisarius, Justinian's general, and his soldiers as their rescuers. But such a decision couldn't be carried out until the Arian obstacles were removed. A turning point came when the military campaigns in Africa and Italy saw Belisarius's winning armies deliver a final defeat to Arianism. Procopius tells that Justinian started the African war to help the Christians, Catholics. Even though the palace prefect nearly convinced him not to, a dream told Justinian to go ahead, promising him that by helping the Christians, he would bring down the Vandals. Mosheim writes, The Greeks who had accepted the decisions of the Council of Nice, i.e. the Catholics, were harsh and oppressive towards the Arians wherever they could. On the other hand, the Nicenians were treated badly by their enemies, the Arians, especially in Africa and Italy, where they felt the power of the Arians in their bitter backlash. But Arianism's victories didn't last, and its good days ended when the Vandals were driven out of Africa and the Goths out of Italy by Justinian's forces. Eliot sums up this time by naming three big enemies that had to be beaten to clear the way for the Pope. I could mention three that were removed from before the Pope from the original list, the Heruli under Odoacer, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. Looking at the historical accounts mentioned, it's clear that the three powers that were taken out were the Heruli in AD 493, the Vandals in 534, 
and finally the Ostrogoths in 553. However, the last group's real opposition to Justinian's decision ended when they were kicked out of Rome by Belisarius in 583. The prophecy of the little horn saying it would speak great words against the Most High has sadly come true throughout the records of the popes. They've either sought or allowed the use of titles so extreme and disrespectful that even heavenly beings would seem small in comparison. Lucius Ferraris in his Prompta Bibliotheca, which the Catholic Encyclopedia praises as a real encyclopedia of religious knowledge and a valuable source of information, writes in its article on the Pope that the Pope is of such high rank and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as if he were God and the representative of God. The Pope alone deserves to be called Most Holy, because he alone is the representative of Christ, who is the source of all holiness. He is also the divine ruler and supreme emperor and king of kings. Hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown, as king of heaven of earth and of the underworld. The Pope is, as if he were God on earth, the only ruler of Christ's followers, the chief king of kings having full power, to whom the all-powerful God has given control not only of the earthly but also of the heavenly kingdom. The Pope is of such great authority and power that he can change, explain, or interpret even divine laws. During the fourth session of the Fifth Lateran Council, Christopher Marcellus in a speech to the Pope said, You are the shepherd, you are the doctor, you are the guide, you are the farmer. Finally, you are like another god on earth. Adam Clark goes further on verse 25. He shall speak as if he were God. St. Jerome quotes this from Symmachus. This fits best and most fully to the popes of Rome. They've claimed they're perfect, which is something only God can be. They say they can forgive sins, which is God's job alone. They say they can control who gets into heaven, which is also only up to God. They say they're greater than all earth's kings, which is something only God can claim. They even go beyond God by claiming they can release entire nations from their loyalty to their kings if those kings don't suit them. They also go against God when they offer forgiveness for sins. This is the worst kind of disrespect. When it comes to the prophecy of the little horn, to wear out the saints of the Most High, it's easy to see that Rome, during ancient times in the Dark Ages, constantly attacked God's church. There's plenty of proof showing that before and after the Big Reformation, there were wars, crusades, massacres, inquisitions, and all kinds of persecution to bring everyone under Rome's control. The stories of persecution during the Middle Ages are scary and heartbreaking, making us not want to think about the detailed events. But to understand this passage, we have to look back at some things that happened during those sad times. Albert Barnes, in his commentary on this passage, notes, Is there any doubt that this is true about the papacy, the Inquisition, the persecutions of the Waldenses, the Duke of Alva's destruction, the burning at Smithfield, the tortures at Goa. In fact, all of papacy history proves that this applies to that power. Just a bit of knowledge about the history of the papacy will convince anyone that what is said here about making war with the saints, verse 21, and wearing out the saints of the Most High, verse 25, directly applies to that power and accurately describes its history. These accounts are backed up by the testimony of W.E.H. Lecky, who says, No Protestant who really knows history will deny that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other organization that has ever existed among people. These horrors were not done in short bursts of terror or by unknown groups, but by a victorious Church with all seriousness and thought. The fact that victims were often handed over to the government doesn't let the Church off the hook. The church was in charge of decisions about heresy and then handed the offenders over to the secular court. But back then, secular power was just a tool used by the church, under its control and at its command. When the church gave prisoners to the executioners, it used this sarcastic formula, and we do leave and deliver thee to the secular arm and to the power of the secular court but at the same time do most earnestly beseech that court so to moderate its sentence as not to touch thy blood or to put thy life in any danger. Then, as planned, the poor victims of the Pope's hate were quickly killed. Lapicier's testimony is relevant here. The civil power can only punish the crime of unbelief in the manner and to the extent that the crime is officially told to it by church people, who are experts in the faith. But the church, 
knowing the crime of unbelief by herself, can declare the death sentence, but not carry it out. She leaves the execution to the secular arm. The false claims spread by some Catholics saying their church never killed those who disagreed have been clearly proven wrong by one of their own famous writers, Cardinal Bellarmine, who was born in Tuscany in 1542. Nearly made a saint after his death in 1621, Bellarmine did a lot for the church. During a debate, he accidentally admitted the truth. In response to Luther's claim that the church, meaning the true church, never burned heretics, Bellarmine, thinking it was about the Roman Catholic Church, shot back, this argument proves not the sentiment but the ignorance or impudence of Luther, for as almost an infinite number were either burned or otherwise put to death, for that heretics were often burned by the church may be proved by adducing a few from many examples. The respected Alfred Baudrillard, head of the Catholic Institute of Paris, gives an insightful comment on how the church handles heresy. He says, when facing heresy, she doesn't just use persuasion. She finds intellectual and moral arguments lacking and uses force, physical punishment and torture instead. The church set up tribunals like the Inquisition, worked with state laws, and even encouraged religious wars if needed. These actions, even though they claim to hate bloodshed, led to the church encouraging secular powers to cause it in a way that could be seen as less direct and more awful than if the church did it herself. Especially in the 16th century, the church was quite violent toward Protestants. Instead of focusing on moral reform, education, or conversion through inspiring and holy missionaries, the church lit the fires of the Inquisition in Italy, the Low Countries, and especially Spain. Plus, in France under Francis III and Henri II, and in England under Mary Tudor, the church actively tortured heretics. In the second half of the 16th century and the first half of the 17th century, the church not only encouraged religious wars in France and Germany, but actively supported them. A letter from Pope Martin V to the King of Poland during his papacy from 1417 to 1431 gives a scary instruction. Know that the interest of the Holy See and those of your crown make it a duty to exterminate the Hussites, burn, massacre, make deserts everywhere, for nothing could be more agreeable to God or more useful to the cause of kings than the extermination of the Hussites. This command shows the church's stance on heresy. It should not be tolerated but wiped out. It's well known that pagan Rome persecuted the early Christian church, leading to the deaths of about three million Christians in the first three centuries of the Christian era. However, early Christians prayed for the continuation of imperial Rome, as they knew that when this government ended, another even worse persecuting power would come, one that would wear out the saints of the Most High, as the prophecy predicted. Pagan Rome might have killed children but spared mothers, but the cruelty of Papal Rome didn't spare mothers or children. No one, regardless of age, sex, or life condition, was safe from its ruthless anger. The Little Horn was also prophesied to think to change times and laws. The question is, which laws and whose? Definitely not the laws of other earthly governments, since it's common for one power to change the laws of another when it can use its control. The times and laws in question are those that this power would only think to change, but wouldn't really have the ability to alter. These are the laws of the Most High to whom the saints belong, those who have suffered from this power. The papacy has even tried this, the papacy has taken the chance to rework the Ten Commandments, merging the First and Second Commandments into one, and splitting the Tenth into two separate rules. As a result, the Ninth Commandment forbids wanting your neighbor's spouse, while the Tenth forbids wanting your neighbor's property, thus keeping the total count of Ten Commandments. Even though the full text of the Second Commandment is kept in the Roman Catholic Bible and the Roman Catechism approved by the Council of Trent, Detailed explanations are given to clarify that images and likenesses, except those of God himself, are not forbidden by this commandment, as long as they only serve to honor the virtues of saints and not to worship them as gods, which is clearly forbidden. This principle also applies to the relics of saints like ashes and bones, as well as depictions of angels. As for the fourth commandment, which is numbered as the third in the Roman Catholic Church's arrangement, the most authoritative catechism in the church supports the entire commandment, 
and pushes for careful observance of the Sabbath in both personal and public worship as a sacred rite and duty. However, the Church argues that the specific day set for Sabbath observance was linked to Jewish ceremonial practices, which were ended with the coming of Christ. Reasons are then provided for observing the Sabbath on the first day of the week, commonly known as Sunday. To back up this brief discussion on how the papacy changed times and laws, we'll use evidence from the most authoritative catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, this catechism's authority is higher than any other, but it's obviously not on par with the canons and decrees of a council. Before quoting the text, keep in mind that in the Roman Catholic Church's structure, the canons and decrees of an ecumenical church council have both official and supreme power. The Council of Trent, held in Trent, Italy from 1545 to 1563, is a key example of such a council. This council was held to counteract the growing influence of the Protestant Reformation and went in depth on church doctrines and practices. It formally declared, The Holy Synod commands all bishops to explain the sacraments according to the form to be prescribed by the Holy Synod for all the sacraments in a catechism, which bishops will take care to have faithfully translated into the common language and explained to the people by the parish priests. Following this order, a catechism was written in Latin for the Roman Catholic Church by St. Charles Borromeo and other theologians in 1566. It was published in Rome by the Vatican Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith with the title Roman Catechism according to the decree of the Sacred Council of Trent, published by order of St. Pius V, Pontifex Maximus. It was translated into English by Very Reverend J. Donovan, D.D., domestic prelate to His Holiness Gregory XVI, and published in Dublin with a preface dated June 10, 1829, with the title Catechism According to the Decree of the Council of Trent, edited by the command of our most illustrious Lord Pius V. From the fifth edition of the Roman Catechism published in Rome in 1796, we quote the following from Donovan's English translation about the fourth Catholic Third Commandment. The Church of God thought it appropriate to move the religious celebration of the Sabbath to the Lord's Day, meaning Sunday, because on this day light first came to the world. Also, our Savior rose from the dead on this day, opening the way to eternal life for us, moving our existence from darkness into light. So the apostles wanted to call it the Lord's Day. We also see in the sacred scriptures that this day was honored because it marked the start of the world's creation, and the Holy Ghost was given to the apostles on this day. The papacy's announcement that the Roman Catholic Church moved the Sabbath observance from the seventh day, as said in the Ten Commandments, to the first day of the week, which it mistakenly calls the Lord's Day, is a big deal. The apostles are accused of starting the shift from the seventh day to the first, but no scriptural evidence is given to back this up. In fact, there is no such evidence. All the reasons given for this change are entirely based on human and church guesses. The evidence given above sufficiently shows how the papacy has tried to change times and laws. To better understand this Sabbath change, it's helpful to look at other reasons the papacy gives for the change, besides the incorrect claim that it was started by the apostles. The same Roman Catechism mentioned before tries to explain how the Sabbath commandment is different from the others in the Ten Commandments. It's clear that the other commandments of the Ten Commandments are part of the natural law, are forever and can't be changed. So, even though the Mosaic Law has been cancelled, Christians keep observing all commandments in the two tablets, not because Moses ordered it, but because they match the natural law which makes people follow them. However, the commandment about the sanctification of the Sabbath, when you consider the assigned time for observing it, isn't fixed, but can be changed and isn't a moral law, but more of a ceremonial one. It isn't a key rule of natural law because we aren't naturally led or taught to worship God on this specific day more than any other. Instead, the Sabbath was kept by the Israelites after they were freed from Pharaoh's control. Remember, the Ten Commandments were carved by God's finger onto stone tablets while the ceremonial laws were written down by Moses in a book. The Ten Commandments were also written before Moses was given the ceremonial laws. So would it be right to say that God mixed a ceremonial command with moral laws, and then a bold church had to correct this? The reason given for keeping the seventh-day Sabbath according to the commandment itself is because the Creator rested on that day, 
and set it aside to remember his creation, with no hint that it was a preview of future events in Christ, who is the focus of all ceremonial rules. One more quote from the Roman Catechism is worth looking at. The apostles then decided to dedicate the first of the seven days to worshiping God, which they named the Lord's Day. St. John refers to the Lord's Day in his Revelation, Revelation 1.10, and the Apostle says that collection should be made on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16.2, which, as St. Chrysostom interprets, is the Lord's Day, showing that even the Lord's Day was treated as a holy day in the Church. The claim that the Apostles changed the day of the Sabbath is not just wrong, but also suggests that doing business on the first day of the week is a reason for treating it as the Sabbath, against God's unchanging law. This quote also shows the reliance on the interpretations and practices of the Fathers, like St. Chrysostom, instead of the Scriptures themselves as proof for changing the Sabbath from God's law to Sunday. It's especially important for Protestant pastors and churchgoers to think about the following point. The Roman Catechism, ordered by Pope Pius V around the middle of the 16th century, basically includes all the arguments used by modern-day Protestants to justify the shift of the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. Look at these points. They assume, with no evidence, that the seventh-day Sabbath was part of the ceremonial law, despite being at the very heart of the moral law carved by God's own finger, and so was done away with in Christ. They boldly say that the apostles decided the first day of the week should be observed instead of the seventh, referring to John's use of the term Lord's Day in Revelation 1.10, even though the only day God ever set aside as holy and rested on was the seventh day of the fourth commandment. They agree that the Sabbath law of rest fits with the law of nature, needing a break from work and a time for thought and worship. But they argue that the time of its observance can be changed, since according to their thinking it doesn't belong to the moral but ceremonial law and so was changed by the Apostles, the Fathers, and the Church to the first day of the week. Their reason for such a change includes the fact that light first appeared to the world on the first day of the week. Christ rose from the dead on that day. The Holy Spirit came down on the Apostles on the same day of the week, and Paul told Christians to work out their business accounts and set aside a part for the Lord on the first day of the week. All these reasons are man-made, and don't have scriptural authority for such a change. The only reasons given by the Creator and Lord of the Sabbath are that He made the world in six days, rested on the seventh, and set that day apart for holy use on the same fixed and unchangeable basis as He made everything else on the other days of the creation week. Protestants might not know that their defense of the Sunday Sabbath uses Roman Catholic arguments from the Catechism of the Council of Trent, published in the 16th century. However, every argument mentioned above can be found in that book. Our request to every Protestant is to completely break away from the papacy, sticking to the Bible and only the Bible in belief and practice. The phrase, a time and times and the dividing of time, covers the saints, times and laws mentioned before. The question then is, how long would this power keep control over them? A time means one year, two times mean two years and the dividing of time or half a time stands for half a year. So we have three and a half years for the length of this power. In the setting of symbolic prophecy, this time is not real but symbolic. The next question is about the period represented by the three and a half years of prophetic time. The Bible gives us the principle that a day in symbolic prophecy represents a year. Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14:34. Following this principle, a day in symbolic prophecy represents a year, Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34. So, when interpreting the three and a half years of prophetic time, we have to change the symbolic days into real years. In this case, the three and a half years or 1260 days turn into 1260 real years. Cassinius, studying the Hebrew word for day, yom, comments on its plural form. Sometimes yamim stands for a certain period of time, specifically a year, as also the Syriac and Chaldean, Idan, represents both time and year. In the same way in English, several words that mean time, weight, and measure are also used to show specific times, weights, and measures. 
Using this day for a year idea to the prophetic time frame we're looking at, we conclude that the power described in the prophecy would have control over the saints, times, and laws for 1260 real years. This interpretation fits with other prophetic passages in the scriptures like Revelation 12, 6 and 12, 14, which also talk about a period of 1260 days or years in a symbolic setting. In 1844, the judgment started its heavenly work, verse 10. Verse 11 shows that because of the great words which the horn spoke, the beast was destroyed. On December 8, 1854, the Pope announced the belief of the Immaculate Conception. In 1870, Victor Emmanuel's armies took away the Pope's earthly power, at the same time as the 20th Ecumenical Council's declaration of papal infallibility when speaking ex cathedra, as the leader and teacher of all Christians deciding doctrines about faith or morals. Despite the growing respect given to the Bishop of Rome by the clergy, the Pope's earthly power was totally crushed. As a result, Popes locked themselves up within the boundaries of the Vatican in Rome like prisoners until the 1929 agreement with Italy, which gave back his dominion over Vatican City, a small part of the Eternal City. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions will serve and obey him. This is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts deeply bothered me, and my face changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Daniel 7 27, 28. The prophet is allowed to again look at the glorious time of the saints' rest, during which they will inherit the kingdom, forever free from all oppressive forces. In this wicked world, full of the chaos and cruelty of earthly governments and the terrible acts done within the land, how could God's children keep their courage if not for the hope of the divine kingdom and their Lord's return? Their firm belief in the soon fulfillment of these promises gives comfort and strength. And as the screen fades to black, we leave the vivid and mysterious visions of Daniel chapter 7, pondering the deep and ancient symbols he saw. Four beasts, ten horns, and a throne set in heaven. These images may seem distant and perplexing, yet they speak to timeless truths and eternal struggles. In the midst of empires rising and falling, we witnessed a divine courtroom and a judgment in favor of the saints. The Ancient of Days, in all his glory, made a decree for justice and righteousness, and the Son of Man, ascending to his throne, promises a kingdom that will never be destroyed. But what does it all mean for us today? How do these visions from thousands of years ago connect to our journey, our faith, and our world? These are questions we will continue to explore as we delve deeper into the mysteries of the Bible, seeking understanding and wisdom. As we close this chapter of our journey together, let us carry with us the curiosity, the awe, and the hope that Daniel's vision inspires. For in the midst of uncertainty and change, the promise of an everlasting kingdom stands firm. Join us next time as we unfold more chapters and uncover more truth, seeking light in the ancient words and finding relevance for our lives today. Until then, may your path be guided by wisdom and your heart be open to the mysteries of faith.